Um, Scott is going to talk to us about people, community and place, which is a nice transition. Scott's um, background is in landscape architecture and planning. He's project director of a company called Beauty LA, um, a company that um, if you ever drive around and you see really well-designed spaces that are to us today about that. Um, uh, I asked Scott for something interesting about himself and he said that he's spent 15 years in a heavy metal band travelling around Australia doing gigs. So I said, right, you're going to entertain us. Welcome, Scott. <laughs> Context of that, where that uh, description about heavy metal came was uh, when I got in here and I heard uh, Bernard speaking. I was like, "Wow, it's, it's almost the reverse of a live gig." And they've started with the headliner at the front, and all the support acts have to then kind of pass up. This guy next level, but great presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome uh, turnout. Really inspiring to see. I've got to say, I'm I was at the my first time to Kalgoorlie. Um, I've been for about uh, six years now. I've uh, worked around the state, and this is a great pleasure to be here. So, there's been some pretty lofty discussion about the future stuff, which I think is all totally relevant, and it's great to hear. I'm probably going to bring it down a little bit dirtier and a little bit grittier. Um, you know, in the introduction, we've mentioned that for UDLA, we're probably just a group of buffoons down in, in uh, Fremantle. There's 15 of us in Fremantle, we have a small office in uh, Broome. Two people, my friend here, Wendy Dunn, I have to confess her daughter sits next to me and works with me quite closely, and she's to have a baby in six weeks. Huh? So congratulations, Benny. Um, so anyway, I'll get I'll get stuck into it. So I just today I want to talk about place, thinking about place a little bit differently. Perhaps it's not all about the stuff, it's not all about the shiny things. Thinking about people and people systems and understanding of people in the community. And bringing those, stitching those all together, and always say recasting the design process. So I am a design professional, I have to confess, I'm a consultant. I'm going to break and actually admit to some mistakes that we've made and in some projects of a, a, a case study from South that I'd like to run through. Um, but quickly a little bit about myself and my own journey, how I ended up doing what I'm doing. I started off in domestic design in Melbourne as a landscape architect, which I loved. You, you go to people's houses, you sit and talk about their backyards, there's the lemon tree, that's where the dog's buried, this is how I use the place. And it's really robust and detailed, and your, your workshop is stuff up over months. I mean, I, you end up becoming a, a marriage guidance counsellor. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the wife loves white roses, the husband hates roses, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I then moved on sort of through farm planning, which I really enjoyed, more in particular. And farm planning is all about the site, particularly the vineyards, the Tarati aspect, the, the slope, rainfall, all that sort of thing. So, really enjoyed that too. Um, but, sort of been reflecting on this topic. As I, I then moved to um, Hong Kong, uh, probably about 10, 12 years ago, and I really struggled with it. I was up there starting working on really large projects, you know, massive projects. This is the Dalian waterfront. Um, it's about two kilometres in length. There's a little, there we go, all the way around there. A massive project, $50 million project, the sort of stuff that as a designer you just relish. I couldn't get it. I couldn't get the people. I couldn't get the clients. I don't think they got me, which is probably not their fault, but I just couldn't get the fact that I was very rarely seeing the site. There was no engagement with any of the people or any of the communities who were using these places. And I nearly gave up landscape architecture and took off out of Hong Kong because I just, I just couldn't get it. Anyway, I moved to Perth uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is just a couple of projects. I'll skip through them. I'm going to talk about it. I've approached this almost like a party when you fill the fridge full of beer and have too much, too much beer. You don't want to run out. That's the same with my material here. So. Um, I ended up moving to, um, to, to Perth with a big corporate company. Hung in there for a bit. Had an epiphany one day with, with my old mate Greg Rabash, who started UDLA. A few beers at the Soundwave concert, and um, the deal was done. I've been with, with UDLA now for, for four years. I've just finally done it. We've got the right place. So, so moving on to, to Liverpool Cities, um, which is one of the questions that Kate asked me to, to consider. What, what are Liverpool Cities all about? I mean, you guys can Google this sort of stuff. You know, there's always city rankings. Monocle has one. I think the Economist Intelligence Unit has another. Perth teams. Perth's usually in the top ten. Scott, uh, because we know each other, I can say yeah. this. We can't hear you. Sure, would you like me to go to the microphone? Okay. Would I shout if I speak up a bit? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So looking at all these things here in terms of what makes up a livable city, there's all these different items and you can read those sorts of things, safety and access to nature, crime rates, it might be up, sure. Um, business conditions, the health of your economy, etc. They're all great. I feel like a How's this going? It is, is quantitative. You can get statistics and data has some great stuff earlier. But what we're probably interested in is, and what I'd like you guys to think a little bit more about, is the qualitative aspects of what makes a place livable. Um, as landscape architects, design professionals, we probably take ourselves a bit too seriously. We probably philosophise a little bit more than we should. But there's just a few ideas here. You know about the roads, nice furniture details. We're thinking about it. Um, of more of a fluid entity about how people move through a space. Um, thinking about a little bit more, fluid, as I said, in a fluid nature, this whole concept of the place is not necessarily existing but occurring. Because without interactions between organisms and people, we don't have places. So just maybe park that thought. As I said, it's a little bit philosophical. Also considering perhaps the concept of environment. And I love what Bernard said earlier about um, the concept of embracing desert living or living regionally, I think is really important. But also in line with that, sort of thinking about the concept of nature and the environment, thinking in a mutualistic way, not a dualistic way. It's not something that happens out there, it's something that we are natural and the natural part of the world is we're inherently connected with. Concept of place capital, is this still working? No, no I think it's not. It would be better if I stand over here. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. How's that? All right. So the concept of place capital, are you guys familiar with that? Well, it is. Um, <laughs> basically talking about the fact that your health of community, your community and your economy is inherently linked. Healthy communities, healthy places, healthy people lead to inherently healthy economies. Just a couple, there's a couple of really interesting quotes in that I liked. It's quite difficult to do this, but I'll, I might just shout. If I shout, how's that? Yeah. All right. Okay, shout. Sure. <laughs> um, this, this concept here around people attracting people. Again, Bernard talked about a galvanised community. If you've got a galvanised community that's really into a place and driving a place, it's a creative community that, has, that operates on uh, values rather than rules, you're much likely to have a a healthier community, it's a community people really want to be a part of. So again, just thinking about that in terms of understanding the concept of place and how do you develop place capital. I'm sure, I've, as I said, I'll confess I've not been to Kelbourne before, I'm sure it's got a strong place capital but I'm also sure that it's something that you're going to want to develop further into the future. This picture here, I actually just grabbed this the other day from me, we have like a, a library in the office of pictures, I didn't realise that's our Greg Rabashi, our founding director. Um, has faith. And anyone know me, it's all been downhill from there because it was quite a few photos, Greggy. But it's the concept of being of just looking more closely about place and understanding, as I said, looking beyond the objects. So moving on to from place to people. We've been really fortunate to work with Aboriginal communities right through right throughout Western Australia, in particular the Pilbara and the Kimberley. This image here was taken from up, up in the Burrup Peninsula. I'm not sure if you guys are aware where the Burrup Peninsula is. It's, it's just north of Karapa, just out of Karapa. Working with the Morajuga community. And part of what we've been doing is facilitating um, the development of cultural management plans with those communities. We also work with the Yaru quite closely. When you're out on country, if you're fortunate to be out on country with some of the elders who, who are yarning about some country, that's quite a, it's, it's, quite a, it's a really beautiful thing to witness, but you sort of get this, this sense that that both the people and the country inherently linked and both are benefiting from this discussion from being out on country and talking about country and sharing stories. So, bearing that in mind, perhaps thinking about that there's some differences in the way we perceive our landscape. So perhaps from an Aboriginal context, there's the concept of cultural landscape in that we're acting more as custodians of the landscape, that we're connected mutualism, as I mentioned before, that nature and environment, it's not something that sits out there, it's something that's a part of our cities and it's a part of what we do. And it's a two-way shared benefit. If our environment's healthy and happy, so are we and vice versa. Whereas if you sort of contrast this perhaps with a more traditional approach, 
um, around seeing the landscape as a resource landscape in, in, in Western Australia. You can't help it because we've got so many amazing resources. Um, but we, we, oops, we tend to see a little bit more as land as a commodity, something that's there for our benefit. Uh, it tends to be a one-way and sometimes a disconnected relationship. So that's the sort of thing I think most people can make a switch between seeing, going, switching from a resource landscape to a cultural landscape overnight, but even understanding that there's different ways of seeing landscape I think, is an important consideration. So many of people's systems, and again, just thinking a little bit more closely about people, rather than just, you know, shoes that hit the pavement and, walk, and move through spaces of understanding um, there's a lot more to these people's systems in terms of culture, politics, governance, etc. Who's running the place, how they're running the place. I threw this in as a bit of a joke. A mate gave me this a couple of weeks ago. He said, have you read this, you might be interested. I was like, I'm not reading that corporate. You know, that's rubbish. I started reading it though, and actually I think it's a bit of a misnomer. Has anybody read this book? Yeah, I don't kind of think it actually could be renamed just how to be a good human because <laughs> it really talks about just having empathy for other people and listening. And that, that little quote there was a really good one. So if you take that a bit about your career, if you can just listen to people and have empathy, I think you'll, you'll be far better off for it. And so will the community. So listening and, and working with communities is sort of a key departure point for us as design professionals. I use that, but I don't like using that word, but that's what we are. Design facilitators is probably how we prefer to refer to ourselves. And we've worked with these communities right through Kimberley, Pilbara, Esperance, Bunbury, etc. Uh, to a, a small degree, in Kalgoorlie, we recently worked on a community garden um, with, with the city of Kalgoorlie. Um, and so the, the concept of people systems and, and the principles of governance, you probably go what's a landscape architect know about governance. Probably not a heap, but other than what they were sort of thing, this, the concept of inclusivity and, and shared Governance is, is super important. It's, it's fundamental. Um, the fact that you know people are accountable, it's fair and equitable, it has a, a shared um, a shared vision, and it has it, it encourages people from all ages. And it's great to see some school kids up the back here, regardless of age, sex, etc., and cultural background. And so, so, what does that mean for for design and how you're resolving places and spaces? Um, this dude here, Douglas Random, is a bit of a cult hero in our office. I don't know if you guys watch the IT crowd. But, um, but even Douglas sort of says, you know, anything worth anything should possibly require a processing thingy. Um, and I suppose we're concerned in our, in our roles as design facilitators in creating better places and communities that it's fundamental, that the design process is fundamental. So, another famous. Quote that's quite popular around the office. Nietzsche's famous quote that God is dead. I think God has been quoted not long after that Nietzsche was dead. But um, <laughs> what does that mean for design and for, and for re the resolution of, of, of places and the development of places and infrastructure? For us, it's this concept, and when I say us, I'm talking broadly design professionals, not just, like, not just UDLA and myself. Um, is the concept of design with a capital D is dead. If it's not dead, it's on its way out. And by that we mean the concept of an architect, plan, a landscape architect, parachuting into a community and just laying before their vision for everybody to just think, well, you guys have all the answers. And as you go through university, that's what you're taught to do, to have all the answers. But perhaps looking at what we call lowercase design, which is a more gentle, ground up, inclusive approach, um, this is a ground scholar of um, of momentum around this in terms of that we're getting far better, more robust, resilient outcomes. And the concept of the design and the design process is a verb, not a noun. It's not like here's a design. Design is a process and it's problem solving. So recasting our design approach, this little quote here, the help of a place that's having a symbol, I think we can read it, but it's quite important to us like, on how empowered communities are or engaged with having a say in their place. Is fundamental. It's fundamental to us in the way we operate our business, and it's also fundamental to the projects we work in. And so, I'll just go back. That was a little project we did in, in Karawara. Um, there was a discussion before about some of the the, the, the suburbs of Geelong that uh, fairly uh, they have a tough time of it. Um, Karawara is one of them. We've done the same, the same thing down in Withers in Bunbury. 
So this is some of the uh, community data we have as part of that participatory design process. So, so again, trying to solve society's wicked problems. Well, by those I mean vandalism, disengagement of youth, you know, social isolation, all these types of things we sort of believe, even if it's only on a small scale, how we're resolving and creating our places and spaces and involving communities through those. It, it might not, it's not a silver bullet, but it's part of it. And it can and definitely make it. So a traditional design process, if you haven't seen this, you know, basically we go from uncertainty at, at the start, there's all this kind of messiness, hopefully we get clarity and focus, and I argue the concept phase is not where we get clarity and focus in on that really. <coughs> but you go to this messy point and, and end up here at a design. That's that's sort of a more traditional approach. And this little diagram just sort of talks about there's more capital D design. A traditional designer, the centre of the universe, it's all about them, they're controlling it. They might be working with key stakeholders or their client. Sometimes there's this community engagement or community consultation that tends to be one way. <coughs> it might be, let's go out and tell us how you would like your town square or how would you like your local park to look or the streetscapes, whatever they might be. That becomes part of the brief to the, to the designer. They then take that, uh, go away, do their magic, come back and, and lay, it all, lay it all out. So here it is, we've got the answers. Whereas if you're looking at a participatory design, the small scale design, the God is dead design, um, it's more taking the concept that as landscape architects or design professionals, we're facilitators rather than rather than the designers. So we have a much more a smaller approach, and we tend to get people around the off, you know, wherever it happens. It's more about pulling together the right people, the right stakeholders, the right community to develop a place and a space. And as we said, we've become learning partners because one of the advantages of this, every time we've been through this project, or sorry, this process, one of the projects, we get a fundamentally better outcome. There's stuff that we miss. We don't know. If we were to come into, into Kalgoorlie and want to say, we, we, I mean design professionals, we're not, we don't have the answers you guys do because you live here. And you, you work here and you play here and you interact with this place all, all the time. So we can't possibly have all those answers. Um, and look, and you continue to workshop and test this sort of stuff, refine it, hopefully get to the end point where you've got an agreed direction um, that's been embraced by the community, that's supported. You have, end up having community champions. The whole concept of a galvanised community, whether it's you know the entire city of Cal for a certain project, um, it, it really supports. It really gets built on the <coughs> design process. Little, just a little diagram we did for the city of Bunbury because like, how does this work? And it kind of looks like a bit like a virus <laughs> spreading. And in a way, that's how we've started to approach this stuff. Sometimes it's almost like guerrilla tactics of going out and getting the right people, finding the right people and bringing those people in and getting them to participate in the design process. I also want to probably mention that participatory design, as I keep talking about, is a little different from community engagement. Well, forums like this are amazing. It's, it's a lot more robust and it's a two-way education. So the people who participate, as I said, the, the people who consultants like ourselves get a lot more out of it because we can build trust with the community. We learn from the community. Likewise, the community learns from us. That there's a certain reason why we can't have a chocolate marshmallow fountain in the town square because it's, it's not going to work for a whole raft of reasons, but people understand that and then they become champions for that and it filter that back through the community. So I'll give a quick example. How are we going for time? This is a quick example of a project um, that we ran for uh, the Yaru, so up in, um, in Broome, which was looking at a <coughs> cultural interpretation centre up there, the Lingan, the Learning Centre. So we sat down a number of workshops with, with the Yaru community, elders, young crew, their paid staff, etc. And we worked out what's the key to parts, what are the things they want to see in their centre. Oh, I have things here, but it's sort of centred around bush tucker gardens, outdoor learning spaces, offices, conference facilities. So you kind of just put that out in a block, right? Here's our key to parts, this is where we're going to start with. And it's, it's been a little bit hard to see here, but we then sort of road test that with a number of different scenarios. Again, we workshop that with the community. Um, to come up with basically a preferred layout. And in this instance, it really centred around the ceremony around the fire pit, with everything else spilling around it. So, and that's something, again, as design professionals, we would never have chosen this direction. We couldn't have got an outcome like this without going through that process. So just a, nice, a couple more thoughts around this, a little bit philosophical. And the design's never, it's not a single event, it's a live thing, it's an ongoing thing. 
and as design professionals who sort of interject or maybe nudge the evolution of a place or a town or a city at certain points in time, it's never, it's not static. So trying to just get our mindset away from that. So just a couple of summary points here, and then I'm going to jump to this um, project in South Devon. But then the, the concept of place is more about, um, it's, it's more about the stuff, sorry, it's, it's more about the people and not the stuff. And it's about collectively influencing the economy and health and well-being, so that concept of perhaps cultural landscape. Working with collaboratively with communities is, is what we believe is, is the best way to, to get there, and that this, this recast design process is fundamental to that, this participatory design process. I hope this is kind of making sense. It's not rocket science, it's just about opening the doors and bringing in the community along for the, through the design process. Some, you know, we've, we, we've worked on this, as I said, this process from a number of different local governments right across the state. Some of them are quite, can be quite, um, what's the word, a little bit reluctant to take on this process, this process at the start. We recently did the Rockingham foreshore uh, for the city of Rockingham. We, at the start we said, we can do this as an add-on extra. We believe this is the way to go. There's no way. We're not interested in this. We sort of gradually got in there, lobbied them. We had a whole heap of workshops. And uh, some of my colleagues are down there today talking to the Australian Coastal Council. <coughs> Uh, conference in Rockingham, specifically talking about the design process and the fact that we got a far better outcome down there. So I'll quickly talk through this case study in South Headland. Everybody know where South Headland is, next to Port Headland. Um, it was about seven, eight years ago when Land Corp, through royalties for regions, decided there was a, a strategic need to improve the quality of South Headland. Uh, this is quite an old photo, that's the main sort of town centre in through here. This is a huge drain, place floods terribly. And there was an old town square in here, pretty run down, tired place. The existing site, you know, the, everything about it was just tired and drab. All the, none of the edges worked. I mean, it's super hot if you guys have ever been there. It can be a really, um, a really harsh place to be and to live. Um, Centenary Park, <coughs> yeah, what a classy, this 10 ton iron <laughs> bolt. I'm still trying to get rid of this thing. We're on stage four, and I can't get rid of it. We should have sold it off on iron or rubber. But it was tired. So we went through, we, we, we sort of started developing this, this participatory design process. It's been sort of bubbling away. This is one of the earlier projects where we really kind of had the momentum. Uh, the, the support of Landcorp and the Town of Port Headland to really roll it out. So we had the participatory design, all the initial workshops, workshopping scenarios with the community. Um, this is Greg, my business partner. Um, came up with a whole different range of scenarios. So looking at this is this is and this is really object object based stuff, but the curves option, looking at place, lines, etc. Seeing how the community responded to that. We ended up coming up with the preferred scenario, centered around this sort of main lawn space here. Amphitheatre at the back, um, and then really generous paving spaces and for, for all sorts of other activities around. We had a really engaged community by that point. All sorts of workshops, almost like celebrations that we've been through this process, and really trying to gain momentum and support for the project. Just the usual sort of placemaking activity that, that went on at the time. We also felt that it was a conscious decision the South Headland deserves. <coughs> the best infrastructure. Why, why should it be dumbed down just because it's in South Headland? You know, we, we, we worked with the uh, University of Western Australia to develop this um, canopy for the amphitheatre. It's won all sorts of awards. There's some better photos of it. I'll come back to it. But um, the concept being, we need to, we, these people deserve the best. The same, same as any other community. We work with local artists, really trying to, about, trying to, to, to um, really bring the, the cultural aspects of South Edwards to the top. It's got a really large and diverse Aboriginal community up there. Quite a, in some ways, a troubled Ab Aboriginal community, but, all, but also a really strong call to it. So this is as we're starting to develop and construct this thing. So we've got the art, which is laser cutting to the screens. You can see that cast out onto the paving. There it is there. So it's all looking, it was all looking amazing. The other thing I need to mention is that the, the, the public realm, being this public space, all went in before any of the built form went around it. So the hotels and the apartments and all the other things are going to have a little bit like Elizabeth Key. Bearing that in mind. <laughs> Although, you know, it's probably about as slow as Elizabeth Key and everything else happening, but we're getting there. You know, there's all sorts of granite, we've got great steel structures. As I said, no expense spare. We really went high end 
Um, but one thing that was happening at the time that we probably missed was South Headland and Port Headland, like most of the Pilbara, is a really transient place. People are coming and going constantly. In particular, through the, the local government agency, that's to maintain this once it's built. And I think we've, we've probably lost some of those connections. We were so focused, we sort of reverted back to our old selves and went, look at all this great shiny stuff that's going in the South Headland. You know, there's all these, these great jade sculptures and there's, there's the, the, timber, the timber amphitheater. There's another image of it. It's won all sorts of international awards. Shades, the fabrics from Turkey, custom made Teflon stuff. I think we all got a little bit hung up on that. <laughs> then it starts to become adopted. I just love this. So my, my daughter had to say bye at the time <laughs> when I was up there. It was being used and adopted by the community, but there was there was starting to become these sort of rumblings as to, oh, it's too much, it's too early. Um, so we did. Okay, I've got this one working. Yeah, it's third time lucky. So the uptake has been, at this point, quite well received. Another thing I didn't quite, we, we probably, also underestimated was the broader community, not just the community of South Headland, how they would see this space. I'm talking about all the mobs that come out of the desert to use the hospital. <coughs> talking to a mate who works for VTech Services up there, said a lot of the, a lot of the, the communities up there had never seen anything like this in their lives. So there was a bit of almost like culture shock with some of this infrastructure. We had this thing called Pay the Gate, which is when we started realising, well, something's really not going quite right here. And this was at the time when we might have made more detail about this. Brendan Grills was going for the seat of Pilbara. Um, this was the last state election. Um, and he was, we got a, a fairly panicked calls and emails from Landcourt. Get up there, what's going on with the pavers? Because the minister's going to go up there, the place is filthy. Um, what had happened is we'd lost those connections with the city, with the town of Port Hedlam. No one was cleaning the place. So they'd spent millions and millions of dollars on this amazing infrastructure. But um, yeah, we dropped the ball during that process. And then vandalism started happening, so all this great infrastructure. We were absolutely demoralised, aghast at how aggressive this, the community was in vandalising this place. I mean, what the hell's going on? We've got this amazing infrastructure. We've been through a really robust participatory design process. What's going on? And this went on for years. You know, these lights all come from Germany, the highest rated lights for vandalism that you can ever imagine. All getting smashed. We sort of had this idea, actually, for... A, Potentially a business idea, we get the kids up there with new products. If they can't smash them, then it gets an extra certain level of certification. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see here, you know, these lights, we put perspex frames on, we put grills on them. We're continually focusing on this stuff. What are we going to do to protect this stuff and protect the infrastructure and the objects? These guys were driving their four-wheel drives over these benches, which is just so great. Got smacked as well. There's plenty of other places to go four-wheel driving. Um, they slashed this, the fabric, was people climbing up and slashing the vandal proof fabric. Trees were being removed. Also, it was just getting, it was like a war zone. Honestly, it was, it was like a war zone. But then the penny started dropping as we look, were looking to the next stage of, of work to happen. I think we've got to go, we've got to almost hit reset here. Uh, one, the other thing to note is that the contractor was a Perth based FIFO contractor. So there was no locals building the place. Of course, we had locals to participatory design, there's no locals building it. So that whole improvement or lifting of capacity was missed. We got to the next stage, the final stage, um, and this is basically we, we worked with Landcorp through a tender process, but to get a local contractor on board. Um, and they did an incredible job. And part of their part of their brief was to work with the local community through engagement, and not only engagement, but through the construction of this project, or the next stage. This is just an image of, these are tree breaks, that just go up and you know, protect, protect the trees from, from vandalism. But we got all the kids to just wrap them in yarn, yarn bombing as we call it, and, and Anna, Anna from my office sort of facilitated this. <coughs> um, <coughs> you can see all the kids are involved. It's a really simple treatment, but none of those have been touched in this later stage of work. We had these other open days where on a Saturday, these kids, we engage with the Youth Involvement Council, which is a, is a council that, uh, sorry, an organisation that helps the Aboriginal kids in and around town. They've got a pretty good understanding of who the troublemakers are. We've got a lot of these kids out on site, free Macca's voucher, um, pick and footy afterwards, help us lay the turf, help us do the planting, etc. Really super simple stuff. Um, so you can see the kids are absolutely pumped. Um, 
this is sort of an endpoint with, with the we've got town court heaven representatives, land court representatives, the client, the community, etc. Everybody was a bit of a fairy tale ending, not quite, but it really turned this stuff around um, from where it started, great participatory design, a real flat spot to what we believe is sort of the right way to go. So it's kind of a real learning experience for me, for us, about how to, to make sure that we sort of um, adopt our own advice through this through this participatory design process and take it right through, making sure that issue of governance is, is, is super important, that all the people who need to be talking, who need to understand um, around what are the requirements of this stuff, improving the, the capacity of the people to learn through design and to learn how to build things and to own and maintain them. So this is kind of a, just a last image of the, of the shelter. Now it's been a, a widely embraced space in Port Hedland. I think Town Port Hedland now use this as part of their logo. Um, they facilitate teddy bears picnics and welcome to Hedland Day. And it's become a key focal point for South Hedland. Unfortunately, some of the other infrastructure has been built in and around them. Um, but as I said, it's, it's come out to be a really significant project. So it's like a really successful project through a simple process. So I'm probably going to leave you on that note. Um, I've covered a few of this stuff quite quickly. But um, as I said, it's not rocket science. It's just about engaging with the local community, understanding the people, understanding the place, and, and, and bringing them through a, along the journey of, of, of the participatory design process, improving the place capacity, which we firmly believe is, is one small way of improving that, that place capital. I'll leave you on that thought. Happy to have any questions. Okay, so the good news is we finally got the technology working, so apologies for that. Um, so we've got um, uh, we've got six minutes to ask Scott any questions. I just wanted to say, Scott, you've got an absolutely amazing beer fridge. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> incredible. Um, and um, I think it was also really humbling for you to come and share a story about something which was a learning process for you as well. I think that actually made that story even more profound. So thank you for that, because I think that that shows enormous character to do that. So thank you. So, questions? <laughs>